Um, I come from a large family. I'm the youngest. My early childhood during the 70s was a simple rural beach kind of lifestyle. It was you had to fight for what you wanted and we're not silent about it either. I first became creative when my mum taught me to sew about the age of nine and ten. I was hooked on making clothes from an early age and I found that was the best way for me to creatively express myself. Mm -hmm. um, through high school, I focused on art and textile subjects and really loved it. And I looked forward to every musty day at school where I could create outlandish outfits and show them off to all my friends. I'd make or find clothing in my parents' wardrobe and wear outfits in different ways to what they had been worn before. Mm -hmm. I also remember I loved the opportunity when I went to the hardware store with my dad. I'd go with him and look all around at the strange tools and products on the shelf and I'd try and work out in my head how I could maybe use them in some creative way. Mm -hmm. um, let's just say I really learnt from a young age that I loved creating things with my hands. Um, while I was studying textiles in my last year of high school, I stumbled across a magazine article on a French designer called Claude Montana. Um, he was considered a fashion genius in the 80s and a design visionary. And I was so intrigued and influenced by his sculptural silhouette that I designed my final textile work inspired by him. I think this was the beginning of me looking at creative ideas in a more sculptural way. Um, the form and the curves is what really captivated me most about his outfit. Um, the way the garment was designed to extend from the body in structure, like designing a wearable sculpture, was what really interested me and I think really um, influenced me on like following the sculptural aspect of work. Um, that's just a short thing about me <laughs> and my creative, you know, influences from when I was young. Yeah, no, it, it was wonderful. I, um, in the 70s, it was kind of predominant that you learnt to sew, especially if you lived rural, because you started making those own clothes and things like that. So yeah, I was very fortunate that, that my mum got me onto a sewing machine from an early age. <laughs> Is it? Um, I feel I approach this notion in my art practice through being creative with reusing accessible materials, whether found or reclaimed to benefit the environment. I live an off-grid lifestyle and the environment that surrounds me is of a great importance. Respect for my natural surroundings is paramount, so I'm influenced in the reuse of materials in my art, so as to save wastage from landfill and things like that. That's not to say I have only used reclaimed materials or I don't have an attraction to natural materials, but this focus has been a large component of my creative work for many years now. Um, in the last year of my undergrad degree and also my honours year at university, I had a strong focus on working with materials that were part of my everyday lifestyle. So I started using newspapers, wooden bowls that I'd found in the op shop, plastic milk bottles and plastic bags. So I started thinking about how to use this material that was in abundance around me in my home and my close environment for my creative work. So I was trying to show how you could use these materials that had maybe considered disposable in new ways, whether in a functional item or just for aesthetic. Um, I was trying to have a language and a communication with the public about your immediate environment, such as the home and also the world environment was very important to me. Um, it's about changing one's way of thinking, changing our existing paradigms with the help of art. Well, sensory experience in my art is very important to me and to be able to touch my artwork is an element that has always been present in most of the work I create. Um, the sensation of touching a surface has always enchanted me and texture in my art is created by the different materials chosen such as thread, metal, wood, plastic and clay. So depending on the materials is whether you've got hard surfaces or soft. So I gather the, the wool especially is what creates that soft surface in my recent artwork. 
Um, I've gravitated to the use of the fabric and fibre in my art to try and embody and enhance the sense of softness to the artwork, whether it's the softness felt by seeing or touching by the viewer. Um, and so I recently bought a tufting gun and I've begun exploring the use of this technique in my artwork. So tufting is a simple terms, an ancient form of textile weaving, usually used to make rugs. And a tufting gun is a new mechanical way of punching the needle through an open weave material base using a form of thread that is either a loop or cut pile. And that's usually what the softness in my work like recently is about. Um, I'm looking at new ways of using the thread and the process of the tufting to create a series of works that have the characteristics and the sense of softness, whether that's in an element achieved through the softness of the touch of the pile or the softness of the eye from the colours of the threads that I've chosen. So the, the softness characteristics and elements come into my work from either the materials I use or the colours that I choose. Um, well, I find colour is textured to the eyes and colour is an important element definitely in all of my work and my life work and also my life. And it's such a powerful element to use. And I use colour to initially attract and, and draw the viewer into my artwork. And then once I've drawn them in, I use the colour to navigate the eye around the work. And I use the colour to create my own visual language. And I think the hardest thing for me is not choosing all the colours and to pair back the colours that I use in my work. So that's probably, you know, a big challenge at the moment. But yeah, I just love colour. <laughs> I wear colour, I live colour, I see colour in the landscape, you know, I see colour um, as objects and forms. Um, yeah, colour is a big part of my life. Well, um, the colours become a, a visual language for me. So it's kind of like the colours sometimes can dictate um, memories of um, my childhood. They can be visual um, stories of the landscape that I've seen and indicate that in my work. Um, you know, it can be colours that triggers emotions. So when people are viewing my work, you know, certain colours might trigger certain emotional reaction to it. Um, but I, I think of it more as a, a personal self-portrait, really. Because I, I, probably a lot of the colours that I end up using are colours that I'm drawn to and that I really love, not necessarily what I think probably the viewer would like. And I really love experimenting with the colours that I match together. So I'm not necessarily after complementary colours going near each other all the time. I like to make, um, you know, colours match together that would necessarily be looked at as mm, maybe you shouldn't have put those colours together, but you see them in the landscape and nature all the time. So it's just a representation of, of those colours and the designs of nature, really. This is difficult to answer um, as it's quite a deep question, I suppose, that explores much of my personality, my craftsmanship, the methods, my imagination and knowledge. And it's an intuitive process of doing of the work. As an artist over the years, I've experienced the doing of my work and other artists' work and found that when getting into a flow, a natural knowing can take over. It's a very meditative experience. The notion of function for me is where the object or shape is as is and not so much crafted to resemble a symbol that would relate a dialogue. In this case, I'm not using the symbolism for symbolic rhetorical meaning. I move in the abstract more so. So the form can function as just that with no additional symbolic dialogue. And this helps the viewer to construct their own meaning and experience from my work without my outward explicit interference as such. Yeah, I think the balance, um, especially um, the way I work is I really work on the form and the shape first and what shape I want to 
create and then the colours are then also worked into the original design of the play of how I want the viewer to read, whether it's a sculpture or a painting or tucked in work. You know, it's um, like I use the colour as a reading of the, the work and it's a really intuitive thing, I think, for me, um, as in what colours I want to use and, you know, like you'll have an original design and I'll have a drawing maybe that I'll be working off, but that's not necessary in the way that you don't stick to it. You, As you're making the work and, and you're processing the work, um, you know, things can change. You can suddenly feel that, oh, I don't want to include that colour or that's not working or, wow, that, that's better. Um, so that's how I kind of get that balance, I think, in it's just a, um, my intuition, really. Um, so all my work is challenging in some way. Um, so I haven't particularly chosen a, a, a definite work, but everything is challenging. So the initial challenge is creating the work from the first ideas and designs in your head. And you try and translate those visions into 2D or a 3D form that's close to or similar to what you envisage. So that's very much challenging with any kind of creative work. And sometimes when I'm starting new works and if I haven't done anything like that before, I can arrive at certain stages of the process and I'm challenged with the questions of, is this working or not? Am I happy with what's evolving? Do I just want to destroy it and start again? But I've learned over the years that these challenges and they're good challenges are in the process of the making of the art. You push yourself to create the best work you can. Um, the Tufting series at the moment that I'm working on at present in the studio um, seems to be the most challenging at the moment. I've been working on a piece <laughs> since Christmas at the moment just going through lots of different trials and errors and, you know, major fails and some successes. So you just kind of can continue learning from the experience of the process. And the fails are good experiences because they guide you on track to what the work should be. And you're, you're the one who knows what to do for the, for the artwork that you want to create and you know the best outcome from it. So, you know, even though you do have lots of challenges and, you know, fails and successes, you know, you're the one that has to make those decisions about continuing on and, you know, hopefully the outcome's what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm really glad that you take it up as a challenge and you're still moving ahead with your work regardless. That's very motivational. Yeah. Well, that's it. It's important, you know. Um, some work can be really briefly easy and, you know, you go from start to go really quickly and then other work, you know, you can take months and months and months before you're happy with the end result. So you just have to keep pushing on and, you know, you're the one that makes the decision about whether just abort and start again or, you know, just keep with it and try something new and then it might work out. So, yeah. Definitely. So Birdsong was a work I created in 2020, so a few years ago. And it was probably around the beginning, well, first year of COVID here. And so I started using materials such as the old wool blankets that I'd found in the op shop. And I'd been experimenting with a technique of long stitch on some smaller works, abstract pieces earlier in the year. And I was thinking about how I could use the wool blankets that I had got from the up shops and the technique of long stitch and I wanted to think about how I could use this in alternate ways to what I already had previously been doing. So I viewed this work, the birdsong work, as um, a painting, so a fabric rather than a 3D work. Um, I've had a fascination with the process of painting but I never wanted to be a painter, but this work, I think, looks like a painting in a way. The thread and the fabric re replaced the paint. So for this work, I took cues from my home environment and 
the inspiration was a local bird call that I find around my house. It's the bird's called a brown cuckoo dove, and it's got this singular monotone call, which for most people, they probably wouldn't like it. It's just a constant sounding like an alarm going off. And I'd provided a creative focus for the artwork, suggesting a narrative of difference to me in the work. So the use of the found blankets and the wool created elements, hopefully, of compassion and acceptance within the context of the difference in mind. So when you looked at it, um, hopefully you got, got the difference in mind about how everything can be different, rather than not just in nature, in human nature and all around you. So I've um, looked at the tufting work I'm creating right now in the studio as thread paintings as well. So I guess they could be viewed as work that have evolved from this bird song, which I did in 2020. It was an experiment in abstract symbolic narrative. So the colors are bright, but the bird call is horrendous. And I put symbolic narratives in it to glam up the brown cuckoo dove's beige kind of world. So to make him look a little bit more exciting. <laughs> yes, well, they're all different works. I mean, I, I tend to gravitate to 3D works a lot. And then, but sometimes I think, oh, maybe I should be doing, you know, painting or drawing or, you know, flat 2D pieces. Because a lot of the awards that you go into, especially in Australia, um, there's not a lot of art prizes that are for 3D for sculpture and also you have to spend those big works as well if you're accepted so um, sometimes it's easy to think of doing works that can easily be couriered and you know sent off easy enough and so that's why sometimes I experiment between the 2D and the 3D surface. So textiles for, you know, a very long time, like techniques such as weaving, needlework, knitting, as examples, they're always being categorised as craft rather than fine art. And that's in a lot of Western societies and Australia is no different. Um, however, in recent years, I've witnessed an acknowledgement from institutions and the general public towards artists who have or are combining creative thought and traditional textile processes. There's been a real shift of perception by the public seeing these forms as artwork, not typical craft. There have been more ex exhibitions being organised in mainstream galleries of these innovative works than an acceptance of textile works in current exhibitions and arts awards. And it's been a very, very slow movement. I'm talking like very, very slow, <laughs> as with a lot of movement. But, um, you know, it's just a new way of seeing, and it's a new way of seeing, especially here in Australia um, currently. Um, I look at myself as an artist who just happens to use fibre and thread and textiles in my work. It's very hard being an artist in Australia. There's not much financial support from government or private business sector for artists in all genres here. And to get your work seen in the mainstream galleries is not an easy process. Um, for any opportunity or acknowledgement, exposure, we have to be very proactive uh, um, about being an artist and submit lots of artworks to art prizes and exhibitions, hopefully to get seen and it's very uplifting when you finally do get work selected and you're just hoping that the right person will see it such as a gallery representative or a collector, an interior designer or an architect. So yeah, it's very hard being an, an artist in general in Australia, let alone someone who works in things such as fibres and textiles. But you know, things are changing. <laughs> 